Sunday night, and my good friend Tony R is here, and he's going to light it up for the next 52 minutes. Like, he gets an extra two minutes tonight, because I was quick in my intro. Wow. So, Tony, welcome. Right on. Thanks for having me in your home. I'm a recovered alcoholic. My name's Tony. From Vancouver, shouting out to everybody that's here participating in their own recovery. Um, I'll be back in two minutes. I drank too much water. I just got to do a fast washroom trip. No, just joking. Um, this is pretty remarkable stuff. You know, the book talked about modem the modem carrying this message. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little different tonight. You know, I, I've been going on a lot of Zoom meetings, and and there's a lot of people out there really really struggling like we're all and, and what we're struggling with is not so much being home home during this crisis is, is being home alone with our own thinking <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm stuck with me what am I gonna do oh my god you become really aware <laughs> of the of the state of your own mental health when you're alone that's why we like diversions and you know a lot of meetings and we like staying ahead of ourselves like distracted and, and then when you're alone with your own thoughts, you kind of realize, man, there, there's a, I'm not alone, right? There's a lot going on up there. And that, that's the way it was for me for a long time, right? There, there's a lot going on up there. And, 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 and that ain't the case today, you know? There's, there's a lot of people, shout out to Kimberly, doing a phenomenal job. There's a lot of AA members stepping up to the plate and being assistant, being of help in a lot of different communities, a lot of different Zoom meetings, reaching out to the newcomers, those that are new in your first five years. Awesome, good to see you. You know, it's pretty, pretty remarkable stuff. A lot of us go, you know, I got 30 days now, I'm not new, right? Yeah, well, you know, in, in our literature, th this is probably the most amazing piece of literature that you could have at your disposal, right? And, and have with you, because this, this is our manual. This is what gets us from where we were to where we want to be. This is this is the what happened. This is the what happened part, right? And and without this, it is kind of like like your your, your, uh, your GPS is broken. You know what I mean? Anybody got a broken GPS here, right? Where we want to go and where we ended up is is kind of like not the story we were hoping for. And and you know, uh, um, my first introduction to AA was probably in nineteen seventy eight. And a lot of people around me knew I mean something different. And, and I knew I needed something different, but I never got that different. I never got the different. The, the desire to have different and experiencing different was, was two very far goalposts apart. Like they're from one end to the other. And I always try to create a different life for myself. But I was always struggling with that internal battle. I don't know if anybody has that here. Anybody uh, present here? Show of hands. Right on, because I'm just, this is kind of new. This is new stuff, talking to a screen. I'm used to being in a room talking to myself, but this is kind of, this is really different, right? Everybody hear me okay? Everybody comfortable? Uh, that's cool, man. Um, you know, as I was reflecting back, I did some meditation uh, before the meeting, and, and I asked those that pray, pray, and, and you know, for guidance. I, I believe there's something really powerful in prayer. You know, and, and you hear a lot of different things in the fellowship. You hear this new this new thing people talk about, the gift, the gift of desperation. You know, anybody that comes to a meeting has that gift, right? But what they really mean, what that really means, that gift of desperation, is the willingness to ask something greater than you for help. That moment of complete defeat. That moment of... You know, a lot of people say it's it's about surrender. I, I think it's about being driven right into the ground, right? Alcoholism, it drives you right into the ground. We admit complete defeat. And then from there, we rebuild. But we need something to rebuild on because left to our own devices, we can't rebuild. And that's why they kind of put this thing together. This is our basic text. This is our itinerary. This is our flight plan. This is our design for living. And if you have a book, it's kind of interesting or you want to write it down, and stuff like that. I'm going to kind of hit some highlights that, that, that have come true in my life. When they talk about in page 164, and if you're kind of new, this is kind of like what, what this book is about, what the fellowship is about, and, and we share experience, strength, and hope. It's kind of like, I don't know if you ever walked through a mall and you've seen one of those travel agencies, and on, on the window, they got these beautiful destinations. They, you kind of look at it and you go, wow, that would look really cool to, to go to this place. And especially if, if you've kind of been 
at a place where you could really use a holiday from yourself in your life. I don't know, you know, at the end of your alcoholism or the end of, of, of getting to that place of, of total despair. I'm sure there's a, of the odd person that's been here that had that, right? And you walk by and you see this, this place that the possibility that you can go to, the nice beaches and all that other stuff. On the other side of the glass is, is a bunch of agents that make that possible. And that's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous, right? There's a bunch of people that say, hey, there's this place that maybe they'll be able to help you. How many people have had that conversation, right? And they send you here and then you hear about all these people talking about all these different destinations or all these different brochures or all these possibilities where you can go. And they talk about being at this place. Right? They talk about the beach, they talk about how great the food was, everything. And you're sitting there and you don't have that experience. Right? Like, and, and you hear these wonderful stories and you think, wow, man, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't I like to have that story? And how do I get that story? And that's what this, this thing is about. That's what we talk about. We talk about our relationship with this story. How can I have a different relationship or a different experience? Because a lot of us, you know, when I, when I came into this thing... I grew up on the streets of Toronto and, and it, like I learned from a young age how to navigate, how to read a room, how to read people and how to kind of navigate through situations. I knew who, who was in the zoo. Like when I went to school, I knew who the guys was to hang around with, who the people weren't to hang around with. I just kind of naturally gravitated to like-minded people and I know who to stay away from and when I went through systems it was the same thing I learned how to work systems I learned how to navigate I learned how to depend on me and my instincts for survival I learned like a lot of different things that started to work against me but I never realized why they were working against me because I never understood alcoholism right like there was my human condition and then there was alcoholism and my human condition was present long before a drink ever showed up. You know, the magic in a drink. It was there long, as long as I can remember. People talked about that. And a lot of people think that's alcoholism. No, that's the human condition, right? And everybody has it. How many different fellowships are there? People suffering from the human condition. And they found something that alleviated or gave them comfort or gave them escape from themselves for that moment. That's why there's so many different fellowships. And they gave them that sense of ease and comfort, whatever they were doing or whatever they were involved in. And somewhere along the line, it turned on them like a boomerang. And Bill talks about that. And, and their life becomes devastated as mine became devastated. And you sit there with a drink wondering how you got there. Because where I wanted to go and where I ended up was two different things. I was always in conflict with myself. There's the life I wanted and the person I wanted to be. And then there's the person I ended up. I realized I couldn't create the life I wanted because I was suffering. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was suffering from an illness. And they call that alcoholism that, that has certain characteristics. So when Bill talked about in his story, there, there's a real miracle of available here. And the hardest part about this whole thing is being present enough to listen or hear what's being presented. They talked about that in, in We Agnostics. and They talked about, am I prepared to be open to a different point of view or a different way of looking at things or a different understanding? And a lot of us are not. A lot of us are really looking for somebody to confirm my own understanding and my own belief and my own ideas. I don't know, probably nobody like that in this crowd. Right? So we come to a fellowship under the lash of alcoholism. We hear all these people talk about a life that's far beyond anything I could ever. And I think most of them are a little, you know, I think there's something seriously wrong with them, which is true. But they're learning, <laughs> they're learning how to function within that. So I went to my first meeting, but I think what's the most important part of that meeting, there, there was something in my life at work long before I suspected it. You know, I was 15, I was standing on the 18th floor of a balcony. I was on a three-day drunk. I just got out of a controlled environment when I was 14 and a half. I got hooked up with some people doing some different things, like-minded people. And, and I was standing on this balcony thinking about jumping because I was thinking if I have to live the rest of my life like this, you could only imagine the mental state. When I look at a 15-year-old kid today, like my kids at 15 and 16, and think what kind of condition or what kind of life would they that person would have to live to think that at that moment, totally drunk, three o'clock in the morning, standing on the 18th floor of a balcony thinking about ending their life, right? 
And, and I think of that conversation I was having with myself and, and, and the despair I was feeling at that moment. But what, what happened without my knowledge is I kind of put out something to the universe, right? I put out that desperate cry from within inside of myself that I needed help and guidance. It was that, that gift of desperation at 15. And what that started was the train of circumstances beyond my ability to see. And Bill had the same experience the second time in treatment, if you've been through Bill's story, which is a remarkable read. It's, it's a story about somebody who's afflicted with alcoholism, what his story used to look like, what happened was his visit with Ebby, and the transition through this thing where he entered a relationship with something greater than himself, that he was able to save himself from himself at all those dark hours within his own within his own experience, like a lot of us are experiencing right now, some dark times within ourselves. And Bill was able to apply some principles to that that enabled him to move past those dark moments, right? He still had them, but he had a solution that he was able to apply to that. But he never just came up with that idea. He never just figured it out himself. Somebody 12-stepped him through that course of action, which is really cool, which we understand today as Ebby. But what which is really cool about the whole story is Ebby called Bill. Bill was sitting at the kitchen table dying of alcoholism. Bill didn't call Ebby, Ebby called Bill. And that's kind of like my same kind of like the same experience is shortly after that that uh, that situation on the balcony. I got a call from a man who said he was my father on my 16th birthday. I never knew my dad. We lived on an ali- uh, under an alias, seeing this is a different format. You know, I have three stories. There's my dad's story, my mom's story, and my story. And I try to stick to my story. And, and kind of like, so my dad called. I didn't know it was my dad. He says, hey, how you doing? I'm looking for this gentleman. Like, I'm looking for this kid or whatever. I'm looking for my son. And, and I thought, wow, isn't this amazing? I met my dad for the first time. And he used certain terminology. He says, hi, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I didn't know what that meant. He says, I live a sober life. I didn't know what that meant either. He says, I'd like to get together with your family and kind of make amends for, for the chaos or the tragedies that I did in your life. I didn't know what that meant either. All I knew was I was meeting this man. He said he's my dad. And all I knew, we, we spent the great lengths trying to stay away from him. So my mom comes home and I said, hey, this guy called me and he says he's my dad. And all she says is, we're moving. That's it. Like, we're out of here, right? And so, long story short, he introduces me to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And and, and what I got out of that first meeting is, uh, honestly, I don't remember really anything. But I remember that feeling I had inside of hope that my life didn't have to look the way it was looking anymore. And it started the idea of recreating my life. And how I started to recreate my life was based on self and my ideas of what God was and my ideas of what I need to have to do to fix self with self based on my hearing. And so what I heard at that first meeting is I had to find God. May you find him now. So I knew how to find God because people have been trying to tell me how to find God my whole life. So I went right back to the church. I went to the Baptist church. I did a bit of Nazarene in case they weren't right. You know, I had that. And I got into the choir and like, I'm doing really good. I got that Mr. Bean thing going on. You know, like, uh, and I've never been high. I'm wearing a tie now. I'm getting my hair cut. Like things are looking good. And I got drunk again, which is kind of baffling. Because I got God, I got church, I'm going to the thing, and then I go on another run. And and then, so then what happened was I was trying to recreate my trust with humanity, which which I kind of, which a lot of us kind of lose. We lose our trust, not only in ourselves, but the people around us. Because no human power, but we don't know that. And so we get to a place of total despair. and, And so what happened was I kept on going in and out of the fellowship. And long story short, some pretty remarkable things happened in the fellowship that kind of when I look back at the time, I didn't think they were that big. But when I look back, and this is what we do with each other, is those moments, those moments that we don't think matter, but really would have a profound impact on another human being. And this profound impact that it had on me, it was kind of like, it's kind of like I was, uh, um, at this time, probably I'm 23 years old. I've been in and out of the fellowship for a while. I can't get sober. I've got some mental health problems happening that are induced from, from my deterioration of my mental state. I'm out of the army for a while. 
Um, I got out of there. I got bleeding ulcers. I'm trying to get sober, but I can't get past my thinking. I can't get past the ghost of Christmas past. I, I'm just kind of, I'm coming to meetings and I'm trying to be the chameleon. Like, what does sober look like? I could be sober, like, I'm surrendering, letting it go. And, and like, I, I, like, I'm the only one that don't know I'm nuts. I don't know, if you've ever seen a crazy person, they're the only people that don't think they're crazy. I don't know if you've had the opportunity of talking to a crazy person, like a newcomer. They don't know they're crazy. It, it's, it's just, I was one of those guys. Like, you got some people coming to the fellowship and they need a band-aid. And you say, oh, look, I got a boo-boo in my life, right? And then you got come, some people come in and they're in shock. Like, you ever see somebody who's in shock? They got a foot going the other way. Somebody is unaware of the condition of their life and they think everything's fine. But everybody around them go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Come sit down and then try to console. I was one of those guys that kind of walked around in shock all the time. Like, I was just totally unaware of, of my own condition. But I thought, you know, if you ask me, self, what do you think? I think I got it pretty good. Just a bit of bad luck right now. But when I look back, I, I was kind of like, I, I was certifiably cheese right off my cracker. Like I was one of those guys that come to a meeting and it's kind of like, whoa, whoa. And I'd walk in like, hi, you know, when they told me I was the most important, most important person there. I believe that for years, man. I just got to, just got to. So I'm at this one year cake. And I'm nuts. I don't know I'm nuts. And I hear these two guys talking about this guy who's getting his one-year cake. I'm enjoying the cake. I'm just like, leave me alone. I'm enjoying it. These two guys are going to me. hey, you better watch that guy. He's really tough. You don't want to mess with him. He's a Golden Gloves boxer. Well, guess what? I don't like that guy. And he consumed my thinking. And that could be any problem we have. It was the inability to shape my thought or th shake the ideas that were being presented in my mind and the inability to rationalize or look at it with a sane idea. That's like the serenity prayer is one of our most powerful prayers, right? So this guy, every time I seen him, I think, you're a tough guy, eh? You're a tough guy. And he's smiling at me. I said, I'll knock those chicklets right out of your mouth. I'll bring the street to you. And he's in a meeting trying to be nice to me. And I'm thinking, anytime, man, anytime. And, and like, like, I think that's a little nuts. So I, at this one meeting... I'm reading uh, the traditions and it, they kind of impact me. And I left the, I left the meeting because I was going through withdrawal. I had an anxiety breakdown. Like I used to have a lot of anxiety when I got sober, like anxiety attacks, like hard to breathe. I, 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 like I'd panic every time I tried to get sober because my thinking and my emotions would just bombard me. And so I'm outside this meeting and, and I'm, I'm hyperventilating and I feel this arm come around me. And this guy goes, it's okay, man. I've been there. We got you. Just breathe, man. Just breathe. Just, and we'll get through this. And I looked over and it was that guy. It was that guy who I would have dismissed or who I would have ran over in my car. He was the only guy that came out of that meeting with 200 people there. There was 200 people in that meeting. He was the only guy that came out and he put his arm around me and he impacted me at an internal level. And I never forgot that, right? The kindness of the people in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've always had that when I come to AA. And I've never had that in, in for long periods of time anywhere I went. And that, that kind of draw that always got me back here. But I never really had the experience of what people talked about and how it works. Where they talked about the recreating their life. And what I'd do is I would apply self to self. And I would get the, the delusion of change. And what happens is I didn't realize alcoholism was lying dormant. Because you can't see, feel, and touch alcoholism. It's a phenomenon. It's an unexplainable event that happens in people with this condition. They call it a malady that centers in the mind. And when you ask self, self, what do you think? I think, I don't want to drink, so that must mean I'm okay. Well, that's not alcoholism. Alcoholism is, is something you can't see, feel, and touch. And so... I'll just go to my last relapse. Um, I spent 300, I ended up leaving uh, Toronto. I got a visit from a sergeant and he thought maybe, and plus a whole bunch of other things were happening that maybe it'd be best that I left. I was kind of getting my own, they were locking me up in my own cell with an observation camera and all that stuff. Like I'm, I'm kind of like I'm a mess, right? And so I ended up, I left 
Vancouver. I mean, Toronto. I ended up in Vancouver at 27, 25, sorry. And I tried to get sober for two years out here. I was living in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now I'm vomiting green bile. I know there's something available to me in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I just can't seem to get it. Like I'm going to meetings, I'm doing all the stuff, I'm trying to volunteer. They even put me on the door greeter once for about five minutes and they thought that wasn't a good idea. I got in a conflict with somebody I didn't like the way he was shaking my hand. So they told me maybe I should set up chairs for a little while. So I'm setting up chairs. And even the old timers didn't like the way I was setting up chairs because they were all cockeyed and stuff like that. I had this old guy come up to me and says, and he'd walk behind me, put up the chairs. He says, if you can't do the little things to the best of your ability, how do you expect to do the big things that I think you whack job, like you're totally cheese off your crap. So he left and another guy showed up, a newcomer that I was, you know, going to show him how to do chairs. And he was setting up the chairs as I used to set them up. And I walked behind him and said, if you can't do the little things to the best of your ability, how do you expect to do the big things? And, and that's how I tried to approach recovery. It's something that I would be able to do based on my own energy and my own ideas and my own application of me based on me. And so what was really confusing was I wasn't getting these things that people were talking about. I just, when they talked about this freedom and this hope and direction and being able to match calamity with serenity and being able to face life on life's terms and being of use in the service to other people, be able to sleep comfortably within their own skin, I wasn't having that experience because my worst time was my alone time. Especially when I put my pillow down, my head down on my pillow, that's when all the ghosts would show up and I couldn't shake it. So what I'd always try to do is create diversions in my life so I, I would stay at an avoidance of self, right? And so my last relapse, I did 360 meetings in 90 days. I was in 412 and 12 studies. And I and I was April 6th. And I remember it was my birthday. I went to a meeting. It was a Thursday. And I thought, what a great job I was doing keeping me sober. You know, anybody ever talk like that? I like, oh, I'm so proud of me keeping me sober today. It's my birthday. I'm 27. Isn't life fantastic? This is 11 years of in and out of the fellowship. I've been living in the fellowship of AA since 85. I mean, sorry, so 87. So 7, 1989 is my sobriety date. I'm, the dates get mixed up because I was 25, came out here. Anyways, long story short, I came out here in 87. This is 89. I just turned 27 years old. April 6th, 1989, and I talked about what a great job I was doing keeping me sober. April 7th, I went. it was a Friday, I went back to that meeting, talked about what a great job I did keeping myself sober the day before. April 8th was a Saturday, I got a three-month chip. I talked about the promises, how everything was coming back. The promises were coming true. I'd like to introduce you to Brenda. This is my job. This is my money. This is my car. Look, all of the external promises are coming true, but nothing was happening inside. But that was unaware to me because I created these the versions of change, right? And so half an hour later, I was drinking. So which was really baffling because just before that, I was talking about how great my life was. And if you ask me why I started drinking again, I really had no clue because to me, my life was going really well. If you looked at all the external stuff, this is all the stuff that I thought was the essence of life. This was all the things that I think we aspire to. This is my checklist. Look at all the things that I have. And so these guys, these guys named, uh, um, back then there was this guy named Machine Gun Jerry. He was the 17th member of Alcoholics Anonymous in Vancouver. And what he did back then, so this is going on 30, probably almost 31 years ago. Um, he was going together, he was going through the fellowship with a couple other guys, Rick and Steve, looking for people who were dying of alcoholism in AA. Of all places to be dying of alcoholism in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, because a lot of people are under the impression that once I'm in a meeting, I'm okay. Meetings makers make it. Well, you know, there's a lot more to it than just going to meetings. That's why they read how it works. That's why they read the preamble. That's why they talk about our primary purpose and the traditions and all. There's more to this, right? So George, who went who went through this thing, he got 12 steps through it, and he had this profound change. Even I noticed the change in George. So what? Whoop, so George started, you know, once we go through this thing, we don't need to ask people permission to start working with them. I don't know where that idea came from. 
we carry this message to the alcoholic who's still sober. Is anybody coming to a meeting has given us permission to start working with them? You know, you don't let them know what you're doing. You kind of you kind of surprise them as you go along. You know, anybody ever have somebody work with you for a little while and then you ask them to be your sponsor and they smile at you and say, okay, you know, I've been doing nothing else for the last three months with you, right? So George was trying to work with me and he was asking me all these crazy questions about the book and about the three pertinent ideas, about this path. And I didn't, you know, after 11 years, I had no based sobriety like all my ideas were based on stuff I heard in meetings so he asked me where's this path and and I showed him a directory I said 90 meetings in 90 days and you'll be amazed before you're you're halfway through it's around 45 days right so like he looked at me really or what are the three pertinent ideas I kind of never got what he was talking about I knew how to mimic them I knew how to say them I had great opinions about them but I never really knew what they meant by that or he'd, he'd go hey what's an alcoholic and I got into the jails, the stabbings, the clubs, the on and on and on, the relationships, the car wrecks. He says, none of that makes you an alcoholic. I got into the consequences of people who drink too much, thinking that's what made me an alcoholic. If I could just drink without consequence, that, would be, that was my goal. But I could never drink without consequence, and I never didn't know why. This is after 11 years. So George goes... So as you see, remember, I'm in 412 and 12 studies trying to help people get something that I haven't got, right? So I'm trying to help them go through a process that I have no idea with. I'm reading this 12 and 12. I used to think John Barleycorn, poor guy, he became our best advocate. I didn't even know who John Barleycorn was. I used to think, boy, I hope my story never gets as bad as his. That's alcohol. I never kind of realized that. So George goes, hey, Tony, he says, uh, we're starting up a new big book study workshop. He says, you've been around a while. He says, why don't you come and help us out next Tuesday? We could really use your help and guidance. And I thought, well, let me go ask my sponsor. I said, Chuck, you know, George asked me to go help these guys through this workshop that they're doing. What do you Chuck goes, I think that's a great idea. I think you should show up there next Tuesday and help them through this process, which is really freaky and which is really weird. Is that the first time I got introduced to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous? in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous because I thought being in a fellowship was the program and you know what I'm not the only one with that experience when I've been looking at all these zoom chats and all that I'm amazed I'm not really uh, it's kind of I'm trying to be really nice here but it's really interesting how many people have no idea that this is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and this is what creates the change sufficient enough for us to recover right a lot of people like myself are hoping that a singular act of surrender and acceptance will be enough to propel me or, or to motivate my life into a whole different direction. But it isn't because my internal, my internal dialogue hasn't shifted. The, the things within inside of myself are still causing me all my problems, but I don't know what they are because I'm used to the noise. Like I'm used to the right within my own mind, so I don't know any other experience than the one I'm having. And so when my voices show up, I don't know if anybody have voices here, when the committee shows up, it is noisy up there, right? It is noisy. Like I, the hardest place to be present is with inside of myself. So I look for diversions outside of myself. So these trying times that we're going with alone within your own house, oh my God, I look back 30 years ago, I'd be like out of my mind. I'd be howling at, at the loud conversations out loud with myself. Anybody at that stage yet walking around talking to yourself, right? You walk by a mirror, you go, oh, you again, <laughs> right? So it's kind of like, like woo, 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 nuts, right? And, and then, you you know, your sponsor phones your cell phone, how are you? I'm good, I'm letting it go. I'm turning it over. I have a sense of serenity and peace, right? You just cack. Kick, kick the cat through the screen door, hypothetically, like just nuts, right? So I go through this process, and these guys are talking about a way of life that I thought they were nuts. Like there's no way you could achieve or obtain this experience or way of life that they're talking about. So they took me through this process, and one of the most amazing things were they said everything happens from within. 
said none of it's your understanding. Step one, two, and three is not of your understanding. It's of our understanding. This power that we're talking about, it's not your understanding. It's our understanding. You could have your own conception of what we're talking about, but you need to know what we're talking about. So when I got to We Agnostics, they explained to me that lack of power was my dilemma. The create a shift within my psyche sufficient enough to be comfortable within my own skin. And I wanted to be comfortable within my own skin. That's why I loved alcohol. Right, That sense of ease and comfort that came by taking, I found the solution to me. But what happened was because of the allergy, I couldn't control the amounts I drank. And what, what happened was there would always be consequences in association with the amounts I drank because of the allergy. And then when I wanted to stop, I found I couldn't stop and I didn't know why. I thought it was the obsession, but I never really wanted to drink. So it wasn't the obsession. What they explained to me was the malady on page 23 is this condition that centers in my mind beyond human aid. They told me that the obsession was a human problem that I could smash, but the malady, this insanity was a God problem that the only thing that would take care of that is a psychic change or spiritual experience that the doctor witnessed that people like us had to undergo. And I tried to create this spiritual experience by uh, modifying my behavior. So I was always working on me. I'm working on this. I'm working on that. The over-concentration of self has always been my problem. What's my favorite topic? Me. I love talking about me. You don't even, even have to be involved in the conversation. Just alone I talk about me. Me, 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 me. Like all day long, who are you doing? Who are you talking to? Me. I'll explain the look on your face, right? <laughs> like I'm just kind of like, like my smile. I remember going, he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on me. He says, that explains everything. Stop working on you. Nowhere does it say to work on you. So they told me about this power that I had to get access to if I was going to recreate my life to get this psychic change or spiritual experience. And I thought it meant go find this power. So that's why I always did that, that thing, go looking for God. God's not lost, right? So what he talked about was I had to find out where and how was I to find this power. They said, well, that's what this book is about. So on page, you know, when they got into this thing, 55, the game, they said this thing's within, but you're blocked by all your resentments, your fears, and all the things of your past that you're dragging along like Christmas past. Remember that story with the guy with the chains and knock on the door? Hey, we're going to visit. If it was only three people, I could live with that. I had a busload of people. I had people like the... Like, I, oh my God, the cold sweats, I'd wake up with night tremors. Like, I had a lot of problems. Anybody have a lot of problems here? I thought it said, there was a slogan in the AA that said, figure it out. <laughs> but there's no slogan that says, figure it out. So they took me through this thing. And where they talked about, which is really well, is the summary, the conclusion, the hope. And they talk about, if you want to look at it later, on page 163 and 164, and these are where we're at. A lot of us are on this where they talk about, they already know, they talk about these people who were isolated alone and just got the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in a small community or a big city. They read this, they're in correspondence with other people like we are now. We're in correspondence with each other, right? They went through this process. They've had this change. They have the recipe of practicing these principles that are maintain within this course of action they're saying by the time you get here our job is to carry this message to other people and they're saying well we know what you're thinking right they know as soon as we start thinking what happens is it's a pretty remarkable thing they say they say we know what you are thinking you are saying to yourself i'm i'm jittery and alone i could not do that but you've You've forgotten, you've just tapped into an inner resource of strength, a power much greater than yourself to duplicate with such backing. What we have accomplished is only a matter of willingness, patience, and labor. So am I willing to do these things, these stupid things that they asked me to do? Am I willing to do a bit of prayer in the morning? Am I willing to do stuff? Am I willing to get online or phone somebody that's struggling to maybe participate in their life a little bit? Am I willing to go through this course of action where I find a different reliance and dependence other than myself? Am I looking for something? And that's what happened with Bill because Bill was plagued with himself. If you kind of look at his story, that's a newcomer story. A lot of people don't get into the transition part of it right and it's so simple to get through it but you need to go through it it's something that just doesn't happen and if it just happens you need to find a way to maintain duplicate and 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 
and kind of cultivate this thing. That's why they talk about it. We've just entered the world of their spirit. Our next function is grow in understanding and effectiveness of what of this internal thing, of this access to this power that we have that creates a shift within inside of ourselves where we're comfortable with where we're at to match calamity with serenity. It doesn't matter what's happening around me anymore. I found that place within inside of me that I can find peace. I found something better than a drink ever did for me without the consequences. And it gives me a life beyond anything I could ever imagine. And we do that here, modem and modem. Like how God shows up in our life is up to you to see or this power that it's always been there. Do I want to cultivate it? Do I want to move in this direction? And when Bill was sitting at the kitchen table talking to his friend, his ideas of miracle were revised right then and there. He's one of the founders. He'd been to treatment three times. If you look at it, he couldn't get sober. Every carried this message to him. He was willing to do what Ebby did, to have the experience that Ebby had. That's it. He went, he started, he went to the hospital for the third time, like me, for the, for the, after 11 years, I went into this big book study workshop, and I went through this course of action through the guide of somebody else. What my life looks like today is phenomenal. I'm in counsel with something greater than me. Bill had the same experience. Everybody that goes through this has the same experience. It's not singular, it's collective. If you want what we have, it's available to everybody, but you need to do what we did to get it. It just doesn't happen. It's not Burger King sobriety. It's not drive through well, I like a bit of serenity with some fries and I'll be back tomorrow for a bit of acceptance. It's not, it's not that kind of deal. You can't have it your way and have what we got. It doesn't work like that. If you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you're ready to take certain stops, steps, not any steps. So this is our manual. This is the only thing we offer as a solution in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it hasn't changed since that conversation with Abby and Bill. Bill went through this in the hospital. His friend promised, like my sponsor promised, like I'm promised, if you're willing to go through this thing, you'll have the same experience. And as Bill went through this, there was a shift. He talked about he was to test his newfound thinking with the new God consciousness within. It wasn't an idea anymore. It became a personal experience with this thing. It's not about working the steps once you've done the steps. It's about working this relationship that you have dependence on something other than you. If you're still concentrating on you and you're still working on you and you're still working on a step, you miss the essence of it. It's about an experience. 30 years later, I'm more thrilled with the experience that I'm having and continue having to continue to grow with, which is remarkable. There's something phenomenal here beyond comprehension. They use that word a couple times. One of the most phenomenal things in my life when you talk about a phenomena, is my sobriety date, April 8th, 1989. I've been sober as the result of my connection with a power greater than myself as the result of the application of these principles in my own life that became personal to me. 30 years later, I live a life beyond anything you could ever imagine. Hell, I was, I was in Vietnam, and this guy walks up to me. We're doing it in, in this Tibetan uh, mon a monastery, whatever you call it, one of those things... Uh, Thousand Stair Buddha, we're doing a, a tour. Tour. This Tibetan monk walks up to me, puts his hand in the small of my back, starts rubbing my tummy and goes, Happy Buddha. Ha Nobody's ever called me a happy Buddha. I've never had a cop go by my cell and go, Oh, Tony, are we happy today? Hey, happy Buddha, how are you? Right? I've never had that happen. People see something in you. Like Bill, when Bill seen Ebby come to the door, his eyes were lit up. There's something different about him, which is available to all of us. Wherever you're alone, get on the speaker tapes, get on the book, get involved. Don't sit there thinking, my God, don't do it. You're in bad company if you're alone. I've never been alone since I've done this. It's pretty remarkable. There's this there's, thing, God will meet you where you are, whatever. It starts with, show me, help me, give me direction. I'll give you a story It's pretty remarkable. They're all remarkable. I have an amazing story. I'm amazed with my story. Because I have the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a story beyond anything I could have ever created. I have experiences that are mind-boggling. Right? It's not my story. It's not my program. Right? This is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not mine. I get to utilize it on a daily basis. Right? The story I have is the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is available to anybody. You'll know a new freedom and a new happiness. That's pretty exciting stuff. From a guy that used to talk to himself 
and people call my name going over bridges from psychosis, talking to paintings, cutting my own hair, puking green bile, to the life I live now is an act of something greater than me. And that's available to anybody. And that's the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you really want to see God at work, we're kind of like God's portfolio. Take a look at the screen here. The people's lives that are living the life they have, the, the most common thread is, is God has entered their heart in a way that's absolutely miraculous. And it starts with this. This guy, I'm in Hawaii. I go to go to this meeting. It's not happening. It happened. Then I went back the next day. It wasn't happening. So I went home. I'm a little discouraged. So I started talking to God. I said, God, I don't know what's going on here. But, you know, whatever you want me doing, doing. So I go down the stairs. I'm going to go smoke a nice Cuban cigar. That's a whole different thing. By the way, I smuggled a whole bunch of books into Cuba. That's another story. <laughs> See how your experience can benefit others. But anyways, uh, moving on. So I, I go down the stairs, the elevator. I'm going outside to the place where I usually smoke my cigar just to meditate and be a part of. God says, this voice I call God, this intu intuitiveness says, no, go over to the breakwater over there. I said, that's 15 minutes away. That's how I talk to God. It's kind of weird. I said, that's like a 15 minute walk through all the rocks. And he says, go, I go over there. I said, I don't want to go over there. He says, go over there. So I go over there. I sit there. I let up the cigar. And then I look over in the breakwater. It's probably like 60 feet away from me looking because I'm sitting up on a big rock fence. And I look down, and there's this guy sitting there, and he's going like this. He's talking. I thought he was meditating. He's a newcomer, right? He's like just nuts. And he's talking. He walks by me, and he, and he goes, hey, how you doing? I said, good. I said, how are you? And he says, ah. And then he says, do you want a snow cone? I said, a snow cone? What's a snow cone? I said, where are you going to get a snow cone? He says, we call him beer here. Why his beer wasn't beside me, is beside him, was, was a question within himself. Because if I'm drinking, the beer is beside me. He left the beer over where he had to walk past me. Grabbed the beer and walked back. This is like 9 o'clock in the morning. He stops and goes, he goes I don't know why I'm stop, stop talking, like stop to talk to you. And I said, okay, what's going on? He says, I live on the other side of the island. Something told me to come over here. And find, be at peace and be alone where nobody would be able to find me. I said, oh yeah, what's going on? So I'm smoking a cigar, he's drinking his beer. And he starts crying. I go, what's up? He goes, you know, he says, my wife just left me. He says, I used to have eight years of sobriety. He says, I'm down there talking to God, why God abandoned me and left me. And he couldn't see, he couldn't see God was working in his life even when he couldn't see it. He was on from the other side of the island sitting there. And I said, allow me to introduce myself. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. God sent me here in this moment to let you know you're not forgotten. You're not abandoned. And regardless of your inability to see what's happening in your life, it's available to you. He told me to let you know that you're still a part of this thing. And we got you if you want to come back. And that's the story of our life here. Like you're not alone. You're not forgotten. Like, look, take a look at your modem. Like, we're, we're, we're in a fellowship of a spirit here that's available to all of us. It starts with, just help me, or what do I need to do? And take the direction of those that went before you to have the experience that we have today. It's a life beyond anything you could ever imagine. And it starts with, show me. Show me, God. Give me the people I need. Or if you have this thing, how could I be of service? Because we're agents of something greater than ourselves. Look at Kimberly Joe. I look at a lot, a lot of people on here who spend great efforts in doing big book study workshops. My, my, my service meeting, my service commitment, I do three big book studies a week. Plus I have my own business. Plus I'm married. Plus I have a dog. Plus I have commitments. Plus, plus, plus. And I have people, plus I go to meetings. People go, so I do a, a big book study workshop Tuesdays and Friday nights in Vancouver. Been going for over 20 years now. It's one of the biggest big book study workshops in Canada. People get dropped off there. People work with people there. Take them through this course of action and they have a life beyond anything you could ever imagine. Wednesday nights in Langley, I also do a big book study workshop there. And I go to meetings. People go, why do you do so much? Why, what can't I afford to do? What can't I afford to do to have the life that I have? How many people have stopped doing the little things to give them the big things? What I've received is in great measures. I've made peace with my past. Every year I go uh, drive, this year I won't be able to do it right now, but I go fly back to Toronto. I go pick up my 82-year-old mother 
in a car. I rent her for three days and I drive her all the way around Ontario and Quebec to go visit her family and friends. You spend three days with your mother and let you, you'll know how spiritual you are. Then I couldn't be with that woman for half an hour without destroying the place. The peace and the happiness and contentment. And that means, like, this doesn't only mean that everything goes my way and I, and I have this thing. That means even when things don't go my way, even when things don't turn out the way I hope, that I still have the peace, the contentment, and happiness. The most powerful prayer we have is the serenity prayer. It's not just acceptance. There's no singular thing here. Like, you know, alcoholics are so weird. Like, you know what? Can I have the drink without the mix? There's no, no. You know what? If you want, you got to drink the Kool-Aid. You know, <laughs> you got to drink the Kool-Aid to get this thing. Like, it's pretty remarkable. It's not like when you kind of think about to have what these people have mean I have to get involved. Like the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity. So the ability to sit comfortably within my own skin to be able to assess. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The ability to be able to see what I can't change and the things that I can change. Right? The courage and wisdom to know the difference. So, here, when this thing happens, what happens is people got busy getting these meetings happening, calling responses, getting big book studies online, getting Zoom meetings happening, spending your time and energy in the service of others, getting the phone from a central office, being available for those who are still making the calls. People are still coming and still dying of alcoholism. Being available to forget where they're at for a second to go work for somebody, go help somebody else. Being responsible, putting a bit of money, their seventh tradition money aside to make sure it gets to central office, New York, that the lights and the wheels and everything keeps on turning. There, there's, there's a life that you will not want to miss. And they talk about this. You'll surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny, not to happy destiny. When does this thing start? When they say, well, may you find them now. It starts with that prayer of desperation. God, whoever you are, whatever you are, this thing that seems to be working in everybody else's life, can you hook me up a bit? My prayer back in the day was, I don't know who or what you are. Show me. You all that in a bag of chips? That's how I used to talk to God. And God will show up if you're, like, it, it's pretty, it's mind-blowing. I'll tell you, when you challenge God, you be, better be prepared to have your mind blown. You better hang on to your ass with both hands because it's going to be pretty remarkable. My, my, my sponsor, the guys that showed me in the beginning, there's, there's a contract on page 63 before going into the third step prayer. The third step prayer is an idea that this may be possible if I'm willing to do the rest of the work. The confirmation of this relationship in step three is step 11. The confirmation of the miracle available to us in step two is step 12. It has to be done through a course of action. It's not something as the result of these steps. So these guys told me about this contract on page 63 that God would provide all that I need if I'm willing to keep close to him and perform his work well. What's that? Carry his message, practice these principles, and stay connected. So I'm on the bus going to Quebec from, from Vancouver because of other a lot of circumstances. So every bus stop, this is like 30 years ago, so every major bus loop where you, where you have to change for another bus, I'd get over the PA system. Any friends of Bill W.? Nobody would come online, eh? So I get back on the bus. I'm sitting in the front of the bus, and it's just me. And I got the Walkmans on, and I got the cassettes to let you know how far that is. For those that don't know, they're square things. You put in a thing, and you have to rewind them with a pen. And I don't got time for that. So I'm on the last part of the trip. I've been on this bus ride for three days. I'm on the last part of the trip. I'm an hour outside of, uh, of where I'm going to get dropped off. And I got some major anxiety. My thinking is taking over. Anybody's thinking taking over? It's me talking to me. It's not a good conversation. Now I'm involving God. Say, hey, you, buddy. Hey, sitting on the bus. You said you'd look after me. You said that you wouldn't let me by the wayside. You said that you would provide all that I need. You said that you would have what I needed to get through this. And so I'm moving like this in the bus. I'm sitting up. This lady goes beside me. She goes, you okay? I said, yeah, I got to go visit these people. I haven't seen them in a long time. She goes, yeah, I had to do that. I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for the last 20 years. My name's whatever it was. I was like mind blown. I looked up and I said, funny guy, funny guy. Ha, ha, ha. And that's how this works. I think 
the big part of this thing is getting self out of the way enough to see how God does work in our lives. And, and if you have any doubt that there's something not greater than you, look at where you're sitting and look at where you're doing compared to where you were and what's happening. Just the mere fact that you're sitting in the condition you're in here looking for hope or have hope or have something is something greater than we could ever kind of put into words. So the best thing we could do is be a demonstration of these things and be available for those who have yet to find this thing. And that's what these Zoom meetings are about. And I pray that whatever God that you have or whatever understanding that you continue to develop it. And I pray that if you haven't found an answer that you found it. And the most disturbing thing that I've ever heard any ever speaker ever say, may the force be with you. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much, Tony. Amazing. Thank you 